Hello everyone. Welcome to this course on understanding Win32 API. So we will be going through the uh, process of uh, understanding how Windows evolved since uh, several years now and then uh, we'll cover some of the basic architecture and then we will jump into Windows API. How to use the native Windows API, it's also known as Win32 API to be able to build applications. So uh, we'll start with a bit of history first. So Microsoft's first operating system was uh, something called DOS that uh, you were probably heard of. So that's how they started and gradually they put user interface and 32-bit uh, architecture, 64-bit architecture and stuff like that. So but the first one, the first operating system that um, uh, actually uh, there is a history around that so it uh, started with Windows 1.0 even though DOS was the point where it started but DOS wasn't built by Microsoft so it was uh, another person so Microsoft got the copyright and the access to source code and then they pretty much owned it and gradually they modified it and then Windows 1.0 came into picture. So that was one megabyte addressable memory and it worked in real mode. So it means you directly access the memory. Nowadays what you have is called virtual memory and the virtual memory is the one which actually interacts with the real memory, the memory stick if you will, the real hardware. Then we had Windows 2.0, 2.1, 3.86 in 386 it's interesting to note that there was virtual x86 mode so you cannot uh, access the hardware directly just like that which was possible in previous windows release so that's where the protected mode stuff actually started uh, towards the uh, development in windows 3.0 actually we had uh, ability to access 16 MB addressable memory. What this addressability means is suppose you have a memory stick which is of size 16 MB and you are running Windows 1.0 so you cannot access your any of the process any of your programs if you will cannot access more than 1 MB such a shame so that's the deal here guys the if the operating system is not able to access that much memory so your programs will never will so that was mitigated in Windows uh, 3.0 and we were able to access 16 MB memory which was a pretty big stuff that time like decades ago then we had Windows 3.1 moving along uh, we had Windows NT now in NT we had uh, we could access like 4 GB of memory that time it was a 32 bit protect protected mo mode operating system so that time actually all these 32 bit things uh, came into picture sometimes uh, we hear this uh, conversation that uh, 32 bit actually started with windows xp but uh, no that's not correct it started with windows nt and then windows 95 98 2k xp and in xp we also had 64 bit support like that much ram could be addressed by the operating system so which is pretty huge actually if you see the number it is 2 to the power 64 so which is 64 exabyte that's quite a lot of RAM right but unfortunately operating system doesn't access that much but here it is like all the RAM is there and uh, even the operating system could maybe one day so and uh, following up we have Windows Vista, Windows 7 I will not talk much on that we already know that so this is like a little bit of history we uh, covered here so that's all then some of the characteristics of Windows it is uh, something called uh, it has many features like if you see here to start with we have preemptive multitasking so what happens is what is the difference between multitasking operating system and others in any other operating system which is not multitasking which uh, none of them exist today at least so uh, at least the general purpose in general purpose computing all of the operating system are uh, multitasking they have have to be able to handle multiple programs so how do they do that how does the operating system can run simultaneously multiple programs the answer is 
the answer is it doesn't it's it it never happens it never can happen instead what happens is something called preemptive multitasking so what happens there is you run a program for a sh very short amount of time like 10 milliseconds or 15 milliseconds and then you run the another program and then you come back to this first program and so on so you give a few milliseconds for a program to run and then when the execution has stopped so it goes to the processing of the next program so that is called time slice or quantum so that is uh, how preemptive multitasking works then second is <coughs> multi-threading now we all talk about processors processor core hey I have octa core I have hexa core stuff like that so what it means is suppose your process it has many threads or there are uh, two different process and each has one thread so what are, what are threads and process we will talk much about that much much later but think about it whenever you double click a program or you run a program from the command line a process is created and it creates at least one thread which actually executes so if two threads are there for one process or for simplicity let's say two programs are there and you double click on them now both are running so both have one thread each so each thread could run on its separate core suppose the the computer has a dual core processor so each of those thread could run in separate cores that is called multi-threading so there you have it preemptive multitasking and multi-threading it's quite simple isn't it then you have something called graphical interface now a lot of people when they interact with servers they would like to use command lines because server wouldn't have a terminal attached to that like the typical monitor and you could just SSH into the server or uh, take it remotely and you manage the server so there the graphical interface it's not that much helpful because you wouldn't need that but in client operating system it's essential like the people would want to click somewhere rather than type it so there it is like graphical interface why it is cool and why all the client operating system needs that then there is something called dynamic linking so when you compile a program if you have compiled a normal C program in Turbo C or uh, Borland C or Visual C++ which I use and my demo would be based on that you specify something called header files so in Windows there is something called subsystems so kind of a think about it like an ability to interact with the hardware so there are some compiled programs there and while you run your uh, uh, while you compile your own uh, program like if it is C or C++ or any other language so basically you call those operating system programs which are already there pre-compiled so kind of a operating system like if you see the size of the Windows uh, installation it's like few gigabytes so definitely there is a so many stuff going on so there are nothing but the pre-compiled programs which actually allows your program to go through them to interact with the hardware those things whenever we write any source code when we compile it we specify those information in the header file like stdio.h iostream windows.h we would be using windows.h in our demo and so many on all the videos basically Win32, Win32 API is all about Windows.h mostly uh, so there you specify these subsystems so they are kernel32.dll Windows subsystem has kernel32.dll which these are just pre-compiled files so there is no difference between .dll and .exe it's just naming convention you could in theory have your compiled program in exe and you could call it which is possible so just as a convention you have DLLs which allows your program when it is compiled when you have the header file specified and you compile it and now you load it into the memory and it could reference those functions those uh, pre-compiled code in the operating system how that happens the operating system does that whenever you click on a program all the references that you have with those DLLs they are injected into the running process so now your process your program let's say a program so we would talk more about process and threads much later so let's say a program now knows where those other DLLs are located 
Now the question is, what if those DLLs are not located? By located, I mean they have to be in memory. It cannot run if it is not in memory. No program can run just like that. So if the DLLs are not in memory, so they would be loaded first and then their address would be injected into these programs and now these programs can interact with those uh, code, those DLLs. So what's happening is, I will summarize it. Uh, it's like little complex, so I will summarize it. You take your source code, you specify the header files, you compile it when it is loaded, how the program will be able to interact with the hardware, you need additional code, you need them to be loaded into memory. If they are loaded, they would have an address. Those address need to be told to your program. Still it is complex, but <laughs> that's all like this is how it happens. So that's the dynamic linking process. And then why in the first place we should learn Winter 2 API if it is so many things going on and we have to learn these things. Just This is just a beginning vid video, introductory one, and we would be having so much of code. Well, why do we even care to learn these things? We could write Windows program in Visual Basic. I have done it. I have done a lot of projects. And MFC, Java, so many stuff. So why do we even bother? The answer is sometimes Windows crashes, like your typical blue screen of death or sometimes something happens and uh, who do you go for uh, like if to troubleshoot these issues like the IT guy but if you are a programmer and you really stuck with a very complicated issue so what would you do if you are a developer if you are a programmer you have to fix that thing right you cannot ask anyone even if you ask doesn't matter no one would be able to solve that unless they have what we call the knowledge of Windows internals and that comes only if you know Win32 API, how it works, how to use it. So then only you can debug those issues. Windows crash dumps, you Google it, this uh, keyword, Windows crash dumps. So you can run a debugger through that. We would be uh, exploring such examples using WinDBG. So crash dump analysis using WinDBG. And it all just goes through Win32 API, all of it. So you cannot know why a program crash unless you know the Win32 API. That's why we care about Win32 API and we should learn them. So now enough talk and uh, let's jump into a demo. So here's the source code and I will be sh sharing this uh, introductory slide uh, in my uh, description section of the YouTube video. Probably I will upload it at SlideShare. I have never used SlideShare so I don't know how it will go but I'll find a way to upload it. So let's run this thing. So I will open up Visual Studio. There's something wrong with the Visual Studio. Ah, I guess it's not responding or something. Ah, there it is. I don't know, maybe I opened some five instances of Visual Studio. <laughs> So this is again, uh, uh, you're launching a program and you're running multiple instances. So you can look out for the, uh, its own APIs, how this is working, why it uh, behaves that way it is. Create a first project. And by the way, this is uh, uh, about Microsoft Visual Studio. So it is uh, Visual Studio Community Edition 2017 and I have install C++ in that so if you have that you will be able to run all this uh, demo and follow along the video create a first project Windows desktop Windows desktop wizard project 1 and then OK console application no we want Windows application and we want empty project and then hit OK so it will take a while and here is our project ready. Let's add a source code, new item, source.cpp looks fine. I will go with it and we'll run our first program. So I will cheat a bit. I've already done that. So I'll paste it here. And this is a typical Hello World Windows program. You have uh, like WinMain here and some of the arguments. So what this means is like it is a kind of a handler to the Windows. So right now it doesn't have anything this is the first program that runs 
and previous instance like if there is another instance like we opened visual studio five times so it can know like if other instances are running so this is command line arguments and this is if you want to show the windows or not so here we have message box which accepts uh, accepts four parameters null for the instance the, we could pass this guy over here so uh, i have decided to not to text message the caption caption it means that towards the top left screen of uh, visual studio if you see that project one uh, if you see that uh, top left project one microsoft visual studio so that's caption and then message okay you want a okay button on your message box stuff like that so let's run this demo let's see so now it's the project a uh, project is building and we have this uh, win uh, windows dot edge so all the uh, uh, this message box is, is actually sitting inside one of those dlls so and we have specified this windows dot edge which has a uh, kind of a hook to all those dlls like we'll talk about dlls uh, much later so it's building and there you have it there we have hello windows so we could uh, change things here like typical hello world and the shortcut is alt f5 if you press alt f5 control uh, f5 so it would do the same so there it is guys uh, and uh, hope you enjoyed the tutorial and uh, check out uh, like subscribe to my youtube channel and uh, i will be making this complete series of uh, windows apis so this is the url for that i will be providing this url in the description section so we would be covering most of the apis to have a good grip on uh, windows api and then we will do crash analysis using windbg and uh, so many other stuff even it will include driver development and uh, doing crash dump analysis for that also using again windbg we will like the break the hell out of his, uh, this uh, windows operating system and we will dig like deep real deep so uh, stay tuned for my upcoming videos and by the way i have another playlist uh, also in my youtube channel so uh, you can if you go to youtube uh, okay <laughs> i guess some uh, connectivity issues are there but you will find this video so just hit my uh, other videos i have uh, windows software development using c++ course also going on so once you learn these apis how you would use that to build something so those scenarios are also covered so hope you enjoyed the course and uh, feel free to like this video and feel free to comment i would like to know that how the feedback is so if this course goes well so probably uh, i would make even much better course like like advanced stuff or something like that so it's very essential that you post your comment if you would like to cover on specifics of the videos uh, windows api if any other questions probably i may not make video on that uh, as uh, i'm catching up and uh, i have i want to look, go in a sequential order so that i would not leave uh, other people behind and i would like to move gradually so that everyone can learn but i will definitely answer if i can to the best of my ability so it's very important that you comment and what you like about this and what you would want me to cover so probably may not now i may cover that in uh, in other videos which would be coming soon and uh, uh, subscribe and so that it motivates me and uh, like these videos and share with your friends i myself couldn't find much of the resources on windows api and all the documents and pdfs i found are very old and so i thought to make a video on this so that uh, it is easily accessible to everyone uh so have a good day guys and uh, i'll see you next time bye bye